You're listening to Alternative Future Radio, home of the weird, resting place of the paranormal. We'll take you to the furthest reaches of the galaxy and beyond. Strange phenomena, aliens, psychics, cryptozoology, conspiracy, holistic health, and UFOs. Alternative Future Radio, where spooky just got weird. Good morning, everyone, and welcome again once more to the Out There Hour. Today, we're going to be investigating something very much out there. The Out There Hour on Alternative Future Radio. The Out There Hour with Basil and Mark. www.alternativefutureradio.com Yay! Yay! Yay. Good morning. Good evening. And good afternoon. (laughs) Europe, Africa, the Middle East, the world, and anybody in between. The Out There Hour. Yes. Dismantling the mainstream one piece at a time. Oh, I like that. Is that your new tagline? Have you been working on taglines all night? I keep saying it. You just keep saying it. Every week until until you get sick of it. I was going with where spooky got weird, but I I like that. Yeah, I know. I know. I do. Um, We're talking to Dr. Robert E. Farrell. Yes. Best-selling author. Yes, Alien Log. Uh, retired professor of uh, engineering from uh, Penn, Penn State University. Yep. Mm-hmm. He's got all kinds of qualifications. Oh, yeah. Uh, he's written, uh, he's a best selling author. He's written two books Alien Log, Alien Log 2, and a factual book, The Science Behind Alien Encounters. Yep. So he's a professional engineer by trade. And he, he, he does feature heavily on the engineering side of the, he the does. UFOs, he, the he, factual he, thing. He has an interest about UFOs and how do they actually fly. Yeah, yeah. He, um, he, he is pretty much an authority. He speaks all over um, the mm. US in uh, Arizona and Connecticut, I think, primarily. He does various talks. He was also in uh, MUFON. I think he was a regional director of the... The Mutual UFO Research Network, I think it stands for, in ah, America. I hadn't heard of that one. Yes, he was one of the regional uh, heads of that for uh, for a good few years, I uh, read. We're very, very, very fortunate to have him on the show today. Oh, yes, yes. Shall we do it? Let's do it. Um, uh, but are we having an ad? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I hope you'll excuse me. I, I just wanted to play the piano just a little a little bit here. and I hope you don't mind. In, in fact, my... My my nurse Chloe is going to join me on on the flute here for j- for just a little bit. If if that's okay with you, I just thought that it would be time to do something fun here in the music room. But you know, you don't have to listen to things like this. There are better things you could be listening to, like alternative future radio, and it's so easy now with their new Android application. You could download it for just a dollar and ninety nine cents, and then you wouldn't have to listen to me play the piano and my nurse Chloe play her flute. Find out more at alternativefutureradio.com. It's just a dollar ninety nine, and, and PayPal will will even bill you in your currency if if you're not smart enough to be using dollars. Okay, hopefully on the line we should have live from uh, from Phoenix, I believe. Uh, Robert Farrell, do we have you there, Robert? Am I right in Phoenix? Yes, you or is, do. Is it Phoenix or just in Arizona? I think I got Phoenix from somewhere. Well, uh, I live just outside Phoenix in a retirement community called Sun City West. Ah, right, right. Oh, fair enough. Well, we weren't far off then. No. And you, you're, you were saying before we went on air that you're a snowbird. You uh, you move around the country, so you're sometimes in Phoenix and sometimes in uh, in Connecticut, uh, following the yes. sun, I assume. Uh, well, trying to avoid the sun in the summertime. <laughs> it gets hot out here. It's, uh, <laughs> it may go to 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, wow. Good grief. Yeah. Well, we get used to it. You know, they say it's a dry heat. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've got a friend in Phoenix and he says exactly the same thing. Yeah, it's a hundred and something degrees, but it's a dry heat, so it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, it's true. It's true. Uh, you can subtract about 15 degrees from whatever you see on the news uh, and, and if you're trying to compare it to your temperature because you have much higher humidity and that does mm. make uh, the comfort level I mean, you could not stand 120 degrees in your country. You you would die, I'm sure. I don't think we will ever see that here. There's probably no danger of that at all. 
<laughs> so we, we, we've, anyway, we've established the weather situation in both countries, but what about UFOs? That's where we want to start. Basil, you've got a question on your lips. Well, it's not so much a question. I just want to point out Robert is a very academic uh, gentleman. Oh, yes. Uh, he's a retired associate professor of engineering from Penn State University. Mm -hmm. He's had an MBA, a doctor of engineering. He spent 20 years in the plastics industry mm -hmm. prior to entering academia. Yeah. And not only that, he's also a best-selling author. Blimey. What do you think to that, Robert? You're, you're not doing too bad there, actually. <laughs> well, um, that's true. This is, I'm in my third career now, and that's writing. Mm. Mm, mm. And you're on to – you've got four books. You've got Alien Log, Alien Log 2, and now remind me where's my piece of paper gone. You've got a third yeah. book, the – have you got my piece of paper oh, there, Basil? The, uh, the second book is rather interesting to me. Yeah? It's Alien Log 2, The New World Order. And I just wonder, what do you mean by the term uh, New World Order, Robert? Yeah, well, uh, I almost regret using that as mm. a uh, subtitle because people automatically assume that that's the uh, Illuminati's yep. version of the New World Order. Yep. And uh, it, it really isn't, uh, to the extent that, it, although it is a... Uh, the New World Order is uh, a one-world government, yes, is the way yeah. it's presented in, in my book. What happened in – by the way, this is a science fiction book we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, but one of my characters, uh, who's a astrophysicist, accidentally gets abducted, and his captor, Quellen, mm -hmm. um, will answer any questions that, uh, that Corey, the, the astrophysicist, has. Um, and uh, one of the questions Corey has <coughs> is uh, – well, why are you uh, creating hybrids? Mm. You know, for what purpose? And Quellen says, well, they're going to be used to usher in the New World Order. And, of course, the next question is, well, what is that? Yeah. And the way – and what it is, it's a one-world government. And, in fact, I wish we had it right now, not necessarily one world, but I wish in the U.S. we had this form of government. It's based a lot on on our government that we have in the U.S. right now where we have a Congress, a Senate mm. – and, and, and a president, and vice president. But in, in the New World Order, the, the leaders, the elected officials, if you want, mm -hmm. uh, are limited to a single four-year term. Ah. And uh, so, <clears throat> so you have uh, the world divided into districts, just like uh, in, in the U.S. We have, we have districts where we have representatives that go to Congress. And then, then we have states, and then there's people who go to the – as senators represent the state, and then, of course, we have the president who represents the country. Mm -hmm. Well, it starts off with uh, everyone in a district is, um, is in a pool. It's kind of like when we used to have the draft. Mm. You know, from a certain age, like 18 to, to 90 or whatever, your name is in the draft pool. Well, in this case, from the age of 25 till 90 or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, your name is in a, in a draft pool for your district. So when it comes time for re-election, about two months before the election, um, uh, randomly uh, a number of people are contacted by my mail or mm -hmm. email probably um, that, congratulations, you've been selected to run for Congress. Ah, so, it's strictly, yeah. so it's strictly random. Okay, so mm -hmm. you have a, a, a random selection of people that represent the cross-section of that district. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the letter goes, goes on to say, by the way, you have 30 days to appeal mm -hmm. because some people may not want to go and represent people uh, in Congress because they, they have a good business and, and yeah. business would suffer. Uh, but anyway, after the, the appeal process, those that survive and, and are, are going to run for election, they have one month to actually campaign and it's publicly financed. So we don't have this problem of, of all this money being spent. You, you probably are aware how much money is being spent in this, this year on campaigning. It's just outrageous. But anyway, mm. uh, it's very well controlled. You know, you have mm. a certain number of newspaper articles and TV appearances and things like that that occur during that, that one month. And then finally, someone's elected. And after the election, they're sent to Washington, in our case, mm -hmm. uh, for two weeks for orientation. And then they go back to their district and they stay in their district. There's no reason to have them in Washington or wherever the seat of the government is. Yeah. Uh, with today's technology, I wonder why we do it today, as a matter of fact. It's like putting all your eggs in one basket. That's a yeah. perfect target. It is strange, isn't it, anyway, that they would do that? It is. So, um, so okay, you, you, you serve four years in Congress and you're done. 
Now, if you thought you liked serving in, in the government, you could throw your hat in the ring to run for a senator. You have to have been a congressperson before you could run for Senate. Right. And so you throw your hat in, and at random, a certain number of names are picked out of that pile of hats <clears throat> and said, okay, uh, you can run. And, and the, again, it's publicly financed. It's a very short campaign of a month. And the person who wins the election again is sent to Washington or the seat of government for two weeks for, for orientation, and then they return to their state where they stay. There's, again, there's no reason for them to reside in, in Washington or wherever it is, uh, and they represent their state. Mm -hmm. um, and then so you serve your four years and you say, you know, I really would like to be president. So you throw your hat in the ring to be president. Now, you have to have been a senator and, of course, then also a representative before you can run for president. And if you run for president, you do indeed, if you win, spend your four years in Washington, along with the vice president. So that's kind of the form of government that, that uh, is the new world order. It's uh -huh. really, truly, truly <laughs> representative of the people, mm, in my yeah. opinion. Yeah, as as you say, you, I you, think you, maybe you the really term... picked the wrong title for that one. <laughs> <laughs> it, a lot of people are going to think that's something entirely different. It would probably sell more books, though. In fairness, <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know, but uh, it wasn't. I, I looked at it as a new world order, which I'm I'm waiting for anxiously. <laughs> <laughs> but more in the. Uh... Start, start, the, de in, the democratic in, style. Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> yes, it is. Actually, it was worth to point out there, um, Robert, I don't think I made it very clear that those books, uh, Alien Log and Alien Log 2, are actually fictional, but based, yes. very much based on science fact. Mm -hmm. But you've also been yeah. the author of another book, and probably what we're going to talk about today, uh, The Science Behind Alien Encounters. That's the one I was struggling to name. <laughs> I found it. So the actual scientific evidence of aliens being on planet Earth? Yeah. Well, where do we where do we start? Where do we with begin? That? Where do we start with that one? Um, God, wow! There's a there's a list well, here. Topics covered include in this book, and there's there's crashes, there's pyramids of Giza, there's traveling great distances, and uh, why do they crash? There's there's an endless list of topics in this book. Is yeah. is there any particular uh, one you started with historically? Did you start with Roswell, or do you go back further? Well, um, my science fiction, I have to jump back to the science fiction for hmm. a moment. No problem. Uh, and you have, to, you have to understand the whole reason I started writing, and, and that is uh, as I was approaching retirement from Penn State, as I, as I s may have said, mm. uh, I, I am convinced that uh, UFOs are being propelled by gravitational fields. Mm. And uh, it was my intent that after I graduated, I would study more deeply into the physics of how do you create gravitational fields. Uh, but then, as I really got close to graduation, uh, to <laughs> not graduation, retirement. Uh, <laughs> same thing. <laughs> it's the same thing, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I suddenly felt compelled that I, I needed to share the information that I had and, and to try and convince the, the layperson, the average person, mm. uh, that this is a reality. Uh, mm. It's as though I'm on a mission to kind of desensitize people to this whole issue of UFOs mm -hmm. because I think that uh, we're, we're going to find out very soon in my lifetime that they are a reality. And, and how we're going to find out, I don't know. But uh, some people might jump off cliffs if they aren't prepared for that. Mm. So that's my mission, and that's why I'm writing the science fiction books, is a, a, a way, a gentle way to feed yeah. the public information about UFOs through a fictional story. So they're, they're, they're learning about UFOs, but they don't realize it. Now, in the case of the, my most recent book, which is The Science Behind Alien Encounters, um, that was based on my lecture mm. that I've been giving since mm. 2004. Um, <clears throat> And uh, I guess the centerpiece of that is is a discussion on, on gravitational propulsion because that's what led me into this thing to begin with is being an engineering type person. I had to try and figure out how do they do that? Well, if I'm going to convince people that uh, they do use gravitational propulsion, which, which is kind of a hypothesis that I have, yeah. uh, I have to then uh, present evidence for that. And so in my book, uh, I start off by, by uh, discussing what people see these UFOs do, you mm -hmm. know, like they've been clocked at uh, thousands of miles an hour without yeah. creating shockwaves, making near right angle turns and accelerating at 100 Gs. Now, now that's the critical one right there. 
mm. how, what kind of a propulsion could you develop that would allow you to accelerate in 100 Gs and I, not kill the occupants? Though? I was thinking because inside the vessel, you would have to be at a, a more bearable, you know, z- as close to zero G, obviously. And that, that in itself is, is, is very difficult, <laughs> impossible well, with what we know today, I suppose. No, it's not impossible, and uh, we'll find out that, that how, how you can do that. But mm. the key is, and, and the only propulsion method that I can think of that would allow that, that would allow you to accelerate at very high rates without any harm to the occupants, is if you're using gravitational field propulsion. And I give a little um, thought experiment, you know, like Einstein used to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, I... And, and I do this in the lecture, too. I point to someone in the audience, and I say, okay, I'm going to put you in this rocket ship. And there's a picture of a rocket ship ready to launch. And I say, you're going to have a walkie-talkie, and I'm going to have one, and I'm going to light the fuse, and off you go. And so we're, we're communicating, and I'm saying, well, now what's happening? And, and you, who are up in the nose of the rocket, say, well, my G-meter says I'm accelerating at 4 Gs, and I'm being pulled down in my couch and I can hardly move, and uh, so far, so good. So I'm watching you, and, and all of a sudden, the flame sputters out. And, but you're coasting upward, and I see now what's happening. And you say, oh, wow, uh, I'm kind of floating now, mm-hmm. and my G-meter says zero. So yep. I say, okay. So I'm watching you, and now you, you've reached the top, and now you're starting to fall down. And I call you back, and I say, what's happening? And you say, nothing's changed. I'm still floating, and I'm at zero Gs. And I said, well, you know, if we had done this experiment on Jupiter, you might be accelerating, falling at 30 Gs or 50 Gs. But yeah. yet you had no sensation of it. To you, you're free falling. Mm-hmm. So that's the beauty. If you can create a gravitational field that propels you, you will either free fall into it if it's a positive field. Yep. Or if you create a negative field, you free fall away from it. And whether you're free falling at 1,000 Gs Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter. You have no sensation. And yeah. if you point the, your, your force to the left, you will suddenly free fall left, like make a right angle turn. Mm-hmm. So, so, so the key is the gravitational propulsion. That fits the evidence. There's, there's other evidence that supports that. In fact, there's some evidence that supports uh, the fact that they are using negative gravitational fields mm-hmm. rather than maybe they use a combination but negative fields um, and I can give you two instances <clears throat> um, there is a, a book that has a lot of photographs in it um, and it was written uh, I think by a German gentleman I don't have his name off hand but um, in this book there's two pictures of a UFO a disc disc type UFO over a field and it's kicking up dust in both photographs, and uh, it's changing position, but still there's this dust is being kicked up. <clears throat> and if you look underneath the craft, there's like an annular area under the craft that looks uh, like there's nothing in it, like it's empty, excluding the dust, in other words. So if they were indeed propelling themselves with a negative field, indeed that field would be under the craft, mm-hmm. lifting it up, but it also would be expelling anything under there, like dust and even air. Yeah. So, uh, so that's kind of evidence that they might be using a negative field. Another another evidence that points to that is there have been times when uh, not many not many reported instances, but at least one or two, where uh, people have come across a UFO that was hovering over a shallow body of water, and um, it left, and they go up to the water where the water was, and it's frozen. Uh-huh. So how is it they freeze the water? Well, again, if they are using them negative field under that craft and they're hovering low over the water there is a very low pressure underneath the craft ah okay and what happens when you expose water to low pressure yeah. well it evaporates faster maybe even boils right yep yeah. so here's this craft hovering for a while and meanwhile while the, the water under it is evaporating very quickly now, <clears throat> during evaporation heat is carried away that's the whole principle between, behind the uh, um, the, these cooling towers at, at yeah. uh, power plants, okay, is, is the evaporation is carrying heat away. Yeah. So you're carrying heat away from this shallow body of water, and uh, if you are there long enough, you may take enough heat out that the, the water freezes. It's exactly the same way as a refrigerator works, through heat. Exactly. Exactly. 
So, you know, that's a couple instances that kind of tell me that they are using a negative fields. Robert, when you to... talk about uh, the effect that they've got on the ground there, the first thing that jumped into my mind, and maybe other people's as well, is crop circles. Could they be a landing site or at least a hovering point for a UFO? Because, well, I mean, some of them we all know are, are man-made because they're admitted. And, but right. but right. all of them, we don't and know. Some of them are so intricate. No. Yeah, D Doug and Dave. Doug and Dave, I think, are getting too old to go around doing that anymore. So. <laughs> is that the two chaps uh, from Wiltshire? Is it the Wil the the yes, Wil Wiltshire yeah. skeptics, or whatever they're called? Yeah, they did a good job of uh, disinformation, actually. But <laughs> mm. I mean, the th uh, the thing is with them is that they they <laughs> they are in fact. Well, if we think that we're nerds, these guys are the uber nerds. They're they're not only nerds, but they're nerds who are experts in geometry and math. Well, we had we had a previous oh. ge uh, guest who mentioned the crop circles mm. and also also mentioned radiation levels and the uh, earth yeah. turning to gr uh, to glass. Was it or the soil turning to glass? I think there's been lots yeah. of different things reported about them. Yeah. Well, what what are your yeah, thoughts on on crop circles, Robert? Well, uh, if we want to talk about the real crop circles, yeah. uh, I think they're they're made by uh, UFOs, mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll mention that how they, I think they might do it. There's a couple ways they might do it. Uh, in my f uh, first book, uh, Corey, the astrophysicist, is is asked about how how he thinks they might be making crop circles, mm. and he says, well. I think they hover over the field and uh, <clears throat> using uh, microwave energy, soften the plants, and then somehow impose some kind of a force field that creates the design. Mm. Uh, that's That was his take. In in the second book, <clears throat> he's now been abducted and he's having this chat with uh, Quellen the alien. And Quellen, by the way, is uh, he kind of teaches in a Socratic method, in other words, he won't answer directly. Mm -hmm. He'll ask another question that forces uh, Corey to kind of reason out the answer for himself. So mm. through this process, he convinces Corey that perhaps there's another way they might be creating crop circles. And that is, again, they may uh, be um, hovering over a field and use uh, ultrasound, ultrasonic sound. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because again, with ultrasound, you can you can heat the nodes, you, you know that, <clears throat> and you can also uh, cause vibrations that would cause the plants to fall into a certain formation, mm. um, and it's called cymatics. By the way, you can you can Google that, huh. and you can see the different designs that you can create by taking a plate and vibrating it at different frequencies. And the nodes that are formed on there cause whatever particles you sprinkle over that surface to form a pattern. Now, if we can do that, imagine what someone with a technology a million years ahead of us, they, they can probably do a little more than what we can as far as creating really fancy designs. Mm. So, so I think UFOs are doing it, and I think they're, they're trying to educate us and maybe testing us to see if we're ready to communicate yet. You know, have we reached a high enough level where we can actually have an intelligent conversation with them, or are we still in the dark ages? It's interesting that you attribute some of the more elaborate ones to the UFOs, because historically I've thought that the elaborate ones would have been more likely to be hoaxes and that the, the simple ones would have been more likely to be landing points. I, I, I often thought that because I thought that the... Uh, the more elaborate ones, I thought that was some geometry student just showing off. Well, the thing is, there's, uh, in my lecture, I talk about crop circles, and I, I go through about, I don't know, 10 different tests that you can apply if you think, if you come across the design. I call them crop designs because they're not just circles. Yeah. Uh, so if you come across the design and you say, well, geez, is that made by people or is that made by UFOs or somebody else? And... Uh, one of the tests is that the, the designs tend to be elaborate and are created very quickly. And you're probably familiar with the design that was created, I think, in 2002 across from Stonehenge. That okay. was a mathematical. It was a mathematical design. Mm -hmm. It was something like 150 circles created, um, and I think it's like 500 feet in, in the mm -hmm. longest wow. direction. Mm -hmm. It was huge. Created right across the street from one of the busiest highways yep. in uh, in England, and um, pilot log, you know, pilots would fly people over to take pictures of Stonehenge, so they would log all that in. So based on pilots' logs, it was determined that that design was created in 45 minutes or less. Wow! Now I I would 
wonder how many people it would take to create that design in 45 minutes. You're, ta alone. you're talking double digits at least, maybe 50? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, at least. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Each of the uh, what, what is interesting is they'd not only have to be maybe 40, 50 people, but they'd also have to practice somewhere hell, else to rehearse and get, yeah. it, get it down to 45 minutes. You would have to do that with military precision. It would, it would look like a military tattoo uh, it would, and, to get it yeah, in 45 and, minutes. And you would probably have evidence that people walked into that field. If you had 50 people walking into that field, I'm sure they would trample – trample the crop then and you you'd say oh well they came off the highway and this is how they got in there yeah there's no evidence of that and and uh you know no one saw this thing being done it was just like almost suddenly appeared so that's one of the characteristics of a real one mm. uh there's other things like the, the the nodes of the plants um show evidence of being superheated very quickly I've that's why that, yeah my, yeah that's why in my first book I mentioned microwaves because it <clears throat> the the it's very similar to what what happened to the plant if you put it into a microwave oven uh, the nodes w would heat up very quickly and the and the moisture in there would form you know steam and and expand the node maybe up to twice its normal size and maybe even pop out the side and, and you'd have expulsion cavities and those are characteristics of a real crop circle yeah um and the plants are, are bent over. They're not broken like Doug and Dave did. And the, and the soil under the plant is not compacted. It might be hard, but it's not compacted. And then there's evidence of um, nickel, iron nickel particles uh, in a linear distribution out, out through the design um, that's not normal. I mean, there's a lot of things that aren't normal about it. Uh, time seems to be altered. Uh, weird things happen if you go into a crop circle. And I haven't been in one, but I've been told... Batteries are drained. No, spe you know. Speaking of being in one, this is this is a. I have to play the skeptic for a second. How come the crop circles are only in certain countries? They're very prevalent in the UK, but in Ireland, yes. which is basically like a giant version of Iowa, it's full of crops. There, there are almost no crop circles here. Um, right. and, and say France, for example, France is mostly agricultural. Uh, full yep. of full of crops. Russia is probably the world's biggest wheat grower. W where are all the Russian uh, crop circles, and where are all the uh, you know Nebraska crop circles and and such like? I know that you do have some in the U.S., but they don't seem to be yes. as prevalent as the U.K. Is there a pattern? What's it all about? What, what's going on there? It seems a bit odd. Well, uh, a lot do up here in uh, in the U.K., primarily in England, mm. uh, and th th someone actually mapped where these things occur, and they occur generally close to uh, monolithic designs like mm. Whitehorse yep. and uh, Stonehenge. So they're, they're very closely associated with those. One appeared there and, last week, actually. Okay. And, and uh, the other thing that someone noticed was um, if you map these, the, the, the monoliths and whatever, mm -hmm. and you mapped the crop circle designs, um, the maps would more or less overlay – and the interesting thing is they discovered that there's a, the, the, the ground underneath has a high chalk content. content. It's, it's a chalky yes. substrate, yep. which t tends to hold moisture. So, so, mm. it, so, you know, these are just things that are correlating. Mm. How to explain that relationship, I don't know, but there is mm. that correlation. Now, maybe, maybe that's why they occur in Great Britain is because you have the chalk fields. Mm, yeah, where maybe you don't have them in Ireland, and we—I don't true. think we have any out uh, here. But I, I do know crop circles occur, you know, in in our, some of our U.S. fields. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I can't explain why they why they even occur outside of England mm. if indeed they're related to chalk fields. Yeah, it seems but, very strange. But however, you you raised an interesting point in that there 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 could be a potential link with ancient. Monuments, uh, at least yes. in some sort of symbolic way, if nothing else. What, what do you have any thoughts on that? Because I know you've spoken before about the the ancient connections with with UFO sightings and interactions and such like. Yeah. Uh, well, again, uh, as far as UFO, as far as uh, crop circles, that, that seems to be one of the one of the observations is is that correlation with ancient monuments, ancient uh, designs. Um, if you're talking now about the Sumerians, um, uh, I guess there's – I don't know if we have any records that would show that they had crop designs mm. in Sumeria. Um, I was just wondering but, whether or not these, these, these 
sites like, say, Stonehenge and the pyramids and other ancient, uh, you know, sort of megalithic sites and ancient sites, could they be markers for UFOs? Could they be landmarks? Could they be something? Could they be something to them? Uh, you know, have, they've obviously been there before. They keep coming back. Oops. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know. It's a possibility. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> yeah, it's a possibility. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that when 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 someone like your <laughs> listeners, if they if they're new to this field, yeah. I can warn them that it's like falling into a black hole. Yeah, uh, you, you're going to spend the rest of your life researching everything. Yeah, and once you become uh, convinced that uh, uh, there are aliens, and and then you read further and you you find out, hey, you know, they've been here longer than we have. Mm. You then have to take a whole fresh look at uh, human history and mm. and you know see but, how see, the aliens yeah. have interacted with us. See that that's the point. Um, um, I think that's what, what where it's coming from. Recently, we've been speaking to a lot of people about ancient civilizations, yep. about the pyramids, uh, Elora. Uh, there's so many well, going back uh, to pre-biblical references and things. Yeah, and uh, there seems to be a consensus among them that we're talking about aliens, uh, an advanced that we either we were an advanced race or we were somehow seeded by an advanced race, yeah. and uh, they don't accept that these great things like the pyramids uh, could have been man-made. So mm. they're thinking there had to, had to have been extraterrestrial help. Yeah. I, I agree with that. Mm. Uh, I, I, I kind of, um, I don't know if you've read uh, Zachariah Sitchin's books. but it's a, it's a uh, name I've heard I, of. Yeah. Well, s some people are skeptical because he, he didn't have a PhD, so therefore he can't know anything. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, Yeah, apparently I, that's how it works. It, well, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but he, you know, he wrote a number of books. Uh, the, the first one in his uh, Earth Chronicles is, um, I believe it was called the Earth Chronicles. Anyway, the, the first one's called The Twelfth Planet, mm. which he wrote in uh, 1976. And then that date's important because he describes things in, his, in that book where, where what he's really doing is, is translating the tablets, the Sumerian tablets. Mm. Uh, he, he learned how to, how to read the cuneiform. Uh, mm -hmm. And he yes. did that because, mm. because of, of his religion. You know, he... he uh, <clears throat> uh, he wanted to find out more about his religion. He didn't believe everything he was taught when he was in school, you know, uh, as far as the history of his religion. So, um, so he taught himself how to read the cuneiforms and uh, and, and learn some amazing things. Uh, the the Sumerian civilization, which is one of the earliest that we know about, although I think that's going to change quickly because of some recent discoveries. But right now, mm. the the Sumerian is 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 pointed to as the one of the first early civilizations, which was in existence about six thousand years ago. And uh, what these Sumerians seem to know a lot about things that you wonder how could they even know that yes. and that is one of the mm. things is in astronomy they, they knew the, the all, structure of the solar of system all of them yes. mm. yeah they knew about our planets and uh, they had an understanding of how uh, our solar system turned out the way it did and um, so they were apparently told this history that uh, at one point Back around four billion years ago, um, a planet called Nibiru, a planetoid, I'll call it a planetoid, <clears throat> called Nibiru, was captured by our solar system. <clears throat> and uh, as it was orbiting on a 3,600 year orbital period, it periodically interacted with, with the planets that it came close to and, and changed things. So, for instance, it, it tipped. Um, uh, Uranus on its axis 90 degrees uh, also its closest approach to the sun was about four astronomical units which an astronomical unit is is the distance the radius of the the distance from the sun to the earth that's one AU mm -hmm. if you would well the closest approach that Nibiru made was four AU which is where the asteroid belt is today mm -hmm. and um, so according to the understanding that the Sumerians had that <clears throat> this planet Nibiru uh, interacted with the planet called Tiamat that existed at that location in that time. And it was, 
It was twice the size of the Earth, and it had a large moon. But during the interaction, some of the moons of uh, Nibiru smashed into Tiamat and uh, fractured it, forming uh, the asteroid belt that we know today, and also sent uh, half of that mass. Remember now, this is four billion years ago, so things were very hot and plastic. It's not like the solid Earth today. Mm. Um, so the, the Earth and the moon were thrown down into a lower orbit where it is today and uh, became Earth and moon. And that was what the Sumerians understood. <clears throat> yeah. Well, uh, that, that uh, description of how things happened explains something that, that today scientists are wrestling with. And that is, uh, how can we have so much water on the planet Earth? Mm. I was, yeah, I was going to, and also the asteroids, uh, they have a, yeah. a, an increasingly large amount of water they're finding on them. Exactly. Yes, uh, Ceres, which is the largest asteroid, is 25% water ice. Mm. Now, so, of course, they're looking for different theories to explain how come we have so much water. One theory was, well, we have all these snowballs raining in from space and it's adding water. But that turned out to not be the answer. Yeah. But if you say, well... Maybe things happened the way the Sumerians said they did, mm. then the Earth would indeed be a more watery planet. Um, I, I, Robert, isn't am I, am I right in assuming the the official science story at the moment is that Earth's water came from bomb, being bombarded by comets? I think that is the well, official that, line, isn't it? I think currently. Uh, well, I don't know if it's. Uh, I know that was one theory, and uh, yeah. uh, last I knew was uh, that was kind of discounted that it didn't really work. <laughs> I saw that on a recent but, uh, BBC documentary, and that's that's kind yeah. of all they came up with, because I, I did wonder where the planet is two-thirds water, and <laughs> yeah. that, that would be a lot of impacts. This planet should look like it's had some sort of pox. It, 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 it's, yeah. it's, <laughs> it, it's, it's a relatively smooth planet, considering the amount of impacts it should have had. Right. So... Uh, the other thing was uh, this, this, the uh, Sumerians believed that uh, at one time Jupiter was a moon of Saturn. And uh, during a close approach, uh, Nibiru threw that moon out of orbit and, mm. and, and it went, fell into an orbit that formed where Pluto is today. Well, guess what? Astronomers now are beginning to think maybe Pluto originally was – a moon of a, one of the inner planets like Saturn. I mean, so yeah. scientists are gradually proving what uh, what already was written in uh, Stitchin's, Stitchin's yes. 1976 book. The other thing is the uh, the Sumerians believe that in about 450,000 years ago, uh, the Anunnaki, and these were from the sky they came, I think was the interpretation. Of that. Anyway, mm. these beings came from Nibiru, mm -hmm. and they came here to mine minerals, primarily gold. And uh, that was 450,000 years ago. And mm -hmm. at that time, gold was easy to get, so they could kind of basically pick it up off the ground. But eventually it got hard to get, and they had to start digging for it and mining for it, and that became laborious because there weren't that many um, Anunnaki that came down. There were several teams of scientists, if you would, mm -hmm. um, and I, I guess maybe they weren't used to dirty in their hands, and they got tired of it after a couple thousand years or so. And and But they had the technology to do genetic manipulation and so one of the scientists in charge of a base in South Africa got this idea of genetically manipulating Homo erectus to mm -hmm. create Homo sapien to give them more intelligence and maybe the ability to speak so they could communicate. And uh, they became basically their slaves or beasts of burdens to do the mining for them. And they did that 200,000 years ago in South Africa, according to the Sumerians. And then this is what Sitchin wrote in 1976. Well, lo and behold, in 1987, there was a paper published by some uh, genetics researchers out of University of California in Berkeley, and they had collected placenta from 147 uh, women from around the planet. And in studying the mitochondrial DNA, um, they were able, and assuming a certain rate of mutation, they determined that the first human, whom they called Eve, appeared in South Africa 200,000 years ago. Well, that's that's kind of neat. Mm. But uh, uh, And the reason they called it Eve is because uh, the mitochondrial DNA, this is, this is not the nuclear DNA that's in the nucleus. 
this DNA is in the mitochondria, which are smaller bodies, energy-producing bodies in a, in a cell. Um, but the mitochondrial DNA is almost exclusively from the female, and mm-hmm. that's why they call it E. Well, you may know that recently um, there's been a huge metropolis discovered in South Africa that's something like 50 square miles in size. It's in an area where they've uncovered ancient mines, and it's been dated to be 160,000 years ago. So all wow. the pieces of this are fitting together and supporting yeah. what Sitchin said in his, his, his 12th Planet book. So that's why I'm a believer of Sitchin. Mm-hmm. Some people uh, think he's, well, he's all wet, but... The point is, he talked about these things before they were discovered. Well, it's, it's, so, in, it's interesting you, men, you mentioned uh, genetic engineering because we recently spoke to archaeologist Pat Chenard uh, about that. And uh, he was um, basically one of the su- surprising things he was saying. He was saying uh, the, the Greek mythological beast like the Minotaur and things like that may have actually been... Uh, genetically spliced uh, mm. beings based on some form of reality mm. i think i don't think he took it too literally but and, uh, kind of Ed- edmund marriage as well a- a- another uh, researcher uh, we had mm. on has been saying the same thing so when you're talking about the different pieces of the puzzles coming together uh, even our, in our own experience on this show yeah certainly we we find we find in this show that people come to talk about two different subjects and they may never have met because one's talking about archaeology and one's talking about ghosts, for example, and all of a sudden we're in a bit of a unique position where we think, hang on, these two people are talking about the same thing. It it so often happens. And it's very, very disconcerting sometimes. (laughs) Well, uh, it's kind of give evidence to the fact that I feel that uh, there will be disclosure uh, Mm. by the aliens, not by our government necessarily, uh, that that they will basically make their appearance and begin... uh, talking to us, you know, maybe on television, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the, the time is getting close. And, and the thing that supports the fact that it's getting close is suddenly we're, we're getting all this information. Hmm. Uh, suddenly we're discovering hmm. pyramids all over the planet, not just in Egypt. Yeah, uh, you know, Bosnia of course and everywhere. That was mentioned recently. Yeah, uh, yeah. China, Bosnia. Bosnia. Uh, yeah. yeah. I think there are some and, under the and, sea and, near Japan as well. Exactly, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so all these things are suddenly occurring, and, and they're not, of course, they've been there, but now we're discovering them, mm-hmm. and, uh, and maybe they, this is this is an awakening. I don't know, uh, Robert. You say that you think that this time is drawing near, and and you're not alone in saying that by far. 2012, we're in 2012. Lots of people are projecting all manner of different things for 2012. Do you, do you think it's going to be this year or sometime soon? Do you think we'll? Do you think any of us are going to see it? Well, as far as 2012, you remember Y2K? <laughs> I remember it all too well. I milked it. I used to work in <laughs> IT. <laughs> Have we still got okay. you there? <laughs> well, that was much... Much ado about nothing, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Put it this way: I yeah, got a che- I got a cheap I flight on twenty twelve because I, I had no I had no worries at all. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I think nothing really is nothing dramatic is going to change. Maybe the stock market will crash hmm. again or something like that. But I just wondered uh, whether or not think... it might be a self fulfilling prophecy if the planet is in a mindset where it's ready for something to happen. Uh, and we're sort of half prepared, might that not be a good time to to take advantage of it if you were going to reveal yourself? Maybe. I don't know. I was uh, uh, about three or four years ago, I was in uh, Cancun. We go down there. Uh, we vac- vacation down there for Christmas and New Year's. But mm. uh, I, I went down with a box of my books, and I wasn't able to sell them because I didn't get a license to do that. But I, I would walk along the beach and stop at these really fancy hotels uh, with the idea of uh, putting one or two books in their library for people to read. Hmm. And uh, one of them, they said, well, you have to go out on the beach. There's our little building out there where the, we have our library for our, our our guests to read. And I went out there, and I had two, my first book, Alien Log. Yeah. And uh, the cover of it shows shows two grays. Yeah, I don't know if you've seen the cover of my book, but it's two grays. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I'm walking up to the desk, and, and the gentleman behind there saw my books, and he says, oh, I know who they are. And uh, so we got into a discussion. He was a Mayan, by the way, <clears throat> and um, he had had an experience when 
he was like in the fifth grade where they he was on a bus with his school classmates and they were traveling in Mexico. All of a sudden the bus sputtered and stopped and uh, the teacher, professor he called him, told everyone to get off the bus and they got out and right across the road was this, he said, the most beautiful craft he ever saw it was a UFO hovering and then all of a sudden it took off and it left a, a pink trail of fairy dust or something behind mm. it and, and I'd never heard that before <clears throat> but anyway I asked him I said well what do you think is going to happen in 2012 I mean after all the whole thing is based on the Mayan calendar right mm. so I figured what, what would a Mayan think is going to happen in 2012 he said well we believe that in 2012 the world will be under one religion and one world government that's what they thought that's what he thought oh well and so I don't know if that's going to happen well, it's, that's, we don't have much time left for all that to happen. That's a lot to happen we've in a few got, months. We've only got six months. Yeah. But uh, funny, yeah. funny you should mention that. I think you, you mentioned in an earlier interview, you, you said there's something like 100 sightings a week of UFOs. Yeah. Oh, more than that. There's like uh, 500, over 500 a month. I mean, some months there might be seven or 800. And this is, this is in the U.S., and these are sightings that are mm. reported. Uh, oh, yeah. My suspicion is uh, far more sightings occur than that, but people don't bother to report them either. They don't want they don't want to because they don't want to be stigmatized. No, nope. yeah. or they're just like me. I I saw uh, a Foo Fighter. If you know what that is, we do. It's a yeah. I saw a Foo, I, I, and I, at first I didn't know what it was. I was uh, again down in Cancun. I, it was in the in the morning, like five thirty. The sun was just thinking about coming up over the Caribbean. It was getting light, and there were clouds coming in off the Caribbean, but you could see stars in between the clouds, so I was kind of looking at the stars. All of a sudden, this thing shoots over my head uh, across the unit I was staying in and swoops up behind a cloud, and it was a golden ball. I don't, it's hard to tell how big it was because I had no point of reference, but it could have been six feet in diameter. It was mm -hmm. a golden ball, um, It was, and... and my first instinct was, oh, a shooting star. You know, and then I said, wait a minute, I know better than that. <laughs> that was a Foo Fighter. Well, um, uh, you know, what, what can I say? That mm. the that's definitely. I, that, I don't know how else to explain something like that, except that it was a it was an alien craft, and I believe those the Foo Fighters, if you want to call them that, are actually uh, drones, mm. pilotless drones ah. that. Uh, that are, are monitoring us. Some kind of probe or, or, or such like. Yes. Yeah. I don't want to say they're unmanned because definitely they wouldn't have men, men in them, but mm. uh, they're unaliened. Yeah. They're, they're, they're part of <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, and, and we, they've been around for a long time. I mean, I have photographs of, of them following B-17s during World War II. I sh I, in my lecture, I show these things. And, mm. and uh, I gave a lecture to a, a group of uh, – it was a club called the Army Air Force Roundtable. Now, you may not realize the significance of that title, Army Air Force, but before 1947 in the U.S. Um, Interesting it year. Was, it was the Army Air Force. Exactly. It was mm. the Army Air Force. And then in 1947, it became the Air Force. Yep. So if if you were in the Army Air Force, that meant that you probably – flew planes during World War II, and indeed, about a third of the people in the audience um, had been pilots during World War II. So during the Q&A part of my lecture, one of them stood up and he said, mm. you know, he said, I flew B-17s in Europe in, during the Second World War, and um, two of these things followed my plane, and one of them took a nosedive through the wing of my plane. And it didn't hurt my plane, and it didn't hurt the the Foo Fighter, or the UFO. Ah. So, so how do they do that? And and that's in my bucket list of things to research: is how do they have the ability to pass one solid object through another? People who have been abducted report that these grays seem to be able to walk right through the wall. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people are abducted straight up out through the ceiling. That's that seg past. that segue is very nicely into something I wanted to ask you about. You've mentioned uh, before in previous interviews, and this is a, a pet uh, subject of mine: the Philadelphia experiment. 
you talk about things yeah. passing through things could 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 that have some bearing on that because uh, w- w- believe it or not we were actually taught about the Philadelphia experiment at school we had a rogue oh. teacher who taught us about I, random things I've, se- I've seen the movie it's Philadelphia very good, very good film yeah we watched it at school yeah. and it, I must say it, it sounds kind of related yes I think you're right uh, I, I again that's in my bucket list uh, and what I try to do in my science fiction is at least one or two chapters bring out something uh, that's very science-based and maybe at the cutting edge, if you would, of science. Mm. Um, like in my second book, uh, Quellen's explaining, uh, there was a question by Corey, the astrophysicist, you know, are we on the right track with uh, the Big Bang Theory? Mm. And Corey finds out through Quellen that the Big Bang Theory is wrong and he finds out the correct theory. But uh, so, so this idea of passing one object through another, if you think about, if you look at an atom and, and say, well, how much of that atom is actually solid? Mm-hmm. Uh, about one millionth of one percent is solid, and the rest yep. is space. And so it may just be a matter of manipulating the electrons to get them all in a certain phase. So yeah. that at one point instant in time, the electrons are on one side of the nucleus. And then the, the thing you want to pass through that, so, uh, is maybe you get those electrons on the other side. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it, it's not true science fiction because we, we know that you could do that. We just don't know how to do it. Exactly. I, I always say that the, 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 the aliens aren't violating the laws of physics. They just understand them better and know how to manipulate them better. Yeah, yeah. yeah they just have better tools but, but maybe. Yeah. There's two subjects that we don't hear very much about today. You've just mentioned one, the, the Philadelphia oh, experiment, the Philadelphia which experiment. I, I found very, very interesting. And mm. the Bermuda Triangle seems to have lost its uh, momentum. Uh, the, the, yeah, that seems to have faded from the public consciousness, the uh, Bermuda Triangle, doesn't it? I, w- I wonder, if, is, yeah. w- any thoughts on that, Robert? Connected, not connected? I don't know. I, I I know one theory about ships. The reason ships might disappear is that uh, there's a, that the planet burps gas. Yeah, I've, I've <laughs> heard that. Locations <laughs> and the you know the bubbles, of course, lower the density of the the overall average density of the water that's supporting mm-hmm. the ship, and the ship sinks. I've heard the same uh, theory no. applied to planes as well. The gas causes a drop in air pressure, and then they they drop suddenly and, yeah. and basically bang into the uh, thick dense air underneath. Yeah. So that might explain how they crash, but some of the stories you read about how all of a sudden the pilots discover that they're not where they thought they were. Mm. You know, they're hundreds mm. hundreds of miles displaced from where they were. Yep. Uh, I don't know how to explain that. I mean, mm. there's a lot of strangeness. It's, 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 I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to figure out some of these things. I know <laughs> that. <laughs> I, I think you'd need two lifetimes to explain some of the things that are going on yeah. on, on, on this well, planet. Well, I've already told my doctor I'm going to live to 140 because I need more time. Yeah. <laughs> I just I, I just wonder, um, Robert, um, speaking of disclosure, uh, if you've heard mm. of the disclosure project where 500 government, military, and intelligent witnesses testifying to uh, first-hand experience with UFOs and ETs, uh, what what did you make of that? Or have you heard of it? You know, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, your your question was broken up. Oh, uh, could, could you repeat it? Oh, I was just asking you about the uh, disclosure project. Uh, we, we had a guest on recently about it. It was 500 uh, military and uh, government and intelligent uh, intelligence uh, witnesses uh, testifying to personal experience with UFOs and ETs. A uh, five hundred is quite a number of uh, mm, certainly tra- trained military people. H- have yeah, you? Yeah, I wasn't. Aw- I wasn't aware that they had five hundred. Uh, I knew there was quite a few. I think there was uh, twenty actually at the uh, conference, co- but five hundred right. were, uh, were willing to I've testify. Put, put their name to it. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. That, yeah, I understand that. And uh, well. In, in uh, 2010, I think it was, they had a number of, uh, I think it was like a half a dozen retired uh, Air Force uh, oh, officers yeah. and yeah. one enlisted and talk about the nuclear facilities ah. uh, that essentially were shut down. I don't mean facilities, our nuclear bases. Yes. Bases yeah. that are armed with nuclear weapons, yes. missiles, uh, were basically shut down. And and then there's an incident where uh, a missile that was launched off of the coast of California yes. was actually destroyed. 
Now, was it? That's the thing. I, I remember seeing that. Uh, I, I remember it was all over the news globally, and you could see it was clearly a, a submarine launch from, from what I could gather. And uh, I don't know where it went. Are you saying it was destroyed? I, I wasn't aware of that. Uh, well, this this particular story, uh, maybe it's not the same one, but a missile was being launched from Vandenberg, I thought. And uh, the witness who, who reported this was um, uh, positioned uh, several, maybe 100 miles away or 50 miles away, I'm not sure where. And they had this very powerful um, telescope-type device where they could film the missile launch it, and, and, and actually film it all the way into space because it was so powerful a telescope. Mm. You could watch this thing go through its various stages and everything. And so they filmed this launch. <clears throat> and uh, then they dutifully took the film back to their headquarters. And uh, a while later, they, they, this gentleman was, was called in by his superior and told to sit down and watch the film that they had produced. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, one of the things that sh showed up on the film that they didn't see when they were actually watching it in person um, was this UFO that came up to this, this this rocket that was traveling at thousands of miles an hour. And the UFO just kind of circled around it and did all kinds of maneuvers around it and then started firing lasers at the at the uh, w the weapon, the nose cone, hmm. and uh, blew, blew the thing up. <clears throat> wow. So, well... Um, Robert Salas recently came uh, and spoke before our, our group here, the MUFON group mm. in uh, Phoenix, and he gave a talk about, and he was one of the officers involved in the um, the base in Montana, that where where he had, uh, and he was one of the launch officers, and and he had all of his missiles deactivated by this UFO. <clears throat> I talked to him afterwards, and and uh he said uh you know his feeling is that the the message is the ufos don't want us screwing around with nuclear weapons mm -hmm. and uh that's the message you know stop screwing around with it we're going to just shut them down and uh we're not going to let you have a nuclear exchange mm -hmm. i mean that's kind of the message that he got out of that and i would think that would i mean if if indeed the some of these aliens by the way there may be different varieties of aliens mm -hmm. visiting us but at least perhaps the ones that created us don't want us to destroy ourselves, and uh, they're kind of watching over us, and that's the message: is so stop I just, screwing around. <laughs> I hope we're not an investment. So, uh, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so basically, you would think that the uh, aliens are benevolent, uh, yes. mostly. That that would be your personal thought. Some are right, and mm. in my third book, by the way, called uh, Alien Log Three. Yes. <laughs> but the subtitle is the Dulce Affair. I don't know if you're familiar with the Dulce base in New Mexico. Uh, I'm not. Supposedly... We've heard mention of it. Uh. <laughs> yes. I well, my characters are going to go into Dulce, and uh, I'm a little worried that they're not going to be able to get out of there alive, so that might be the end of my series. I don't know. Mm. I haven't finished the book yet. I've got to figure out a way to get them out. <laughs> but anyway... <laughs> Uh, um, so I, I forget where I was going with that, but uh, <laughs> well, we were talking uh, about benign. We're the, talking the about benign. benevolent aliens, yes. Yes. and we hope you know, they are. Gonna, exactly, you're going to find some that maybe don't have our best interests at heart. Mm. And if you can logically conclude that there's any any aliens at all visiting us, you could equally conclude that there may be thousands of varieties of aliens visiting us every day. But there's some kind of uh, <clears throat> perhaps a a rule or law or something that says, you know, <laughs> such and such an alien group is in charge there. You can visit and you can look, but you can't touch. Yeah. Because uh, it's being controlled by this group X, which is the good ones. Mm. Hopefully. Or it could be um, some <laughs> kind. It could be some kind of an intergalactic arms race, yeah. much like Russia and the U.S. <laughs> used to be. Or we could be a crop. Yeah. We could be a crop. Uh, I hope not. Well, uh, again, I guess. <laughs> I hope the vegetarians. That's all I have to say. Well, one of the things that led me to believe that they were uh, benevolent. Oh, I think we might be losing you I there, think they Robert. Are. <laughs> Actually, yeah, uh, you're cutting in and out. Okay. Um, I think we're we're about so, out of time anyway, uh, Robert. Oh. Uh, but but it's it's been brilliant having you on, and uh, the shame the connection's uh, failing us today. Well, it's only every now and then that I, I only that you you break up a little bit, but normally it's been pretty good. 
Excellent, excellent. Um, perhaps thanks to alien technology. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> if, oh, we didn't even get to talk about if, technology. If we're to base it on Roswell. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Do I have a, we have enough time to talk about time travel? Or, or oh, my God. Um, oh, we've got to... Well, we'll, we'll, we'll make I, I, actually, time. Actually, Robert, if you didn't talk about time travel, I'd be very disappointed. Oh, it's one of my pet subjects. You, you've done what, the, what we've started calling dropped an interesting bomb on us at the last minute, but we'll, yeah. we'll go with it this time. Oh, please, please <laughs> do. On. Please do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well... Uh, first of all, I believe it's possible to travel into the future, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that's simply by getting yourself on one of these uh, craft that accelerates at 100 G. Yeah. And uh, and I have a graph in my book that shows that uh, in 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 the if you're on aboard that craft, and what to you seems like uh, less than a month, you'll be out there 40 uh, light years. Yeah. 40 light years away. Because of the time dilation. And then you turn around you come back. And it's according to your calendar, two months have gone by. But you suddenly see that all your friends are dead because it's 80 years into the future. Yeah. So you can travel into the future. Uh, but you can't go back. I yeah. firmly believe. And, and it's not just because of this idea of the paradox. But, but really it is. Physics, basically. <clears throat> well, Okay. If you imagine that it is possible to go back, let's say, okay, technically there's got to be a way to do it. Well, wouldn't you think that the aliens with their million-year advanced technology would have figured out how to do that? Yeah. Now, if they did, and so if they did go back in time, then they could have interacted. And, and you and I, all of a sudden, you disappear from the scene because there's something that the aliens did five years ago. That mm -hmm. caused you to do something different, and yeah. you're no longer on the radio. Yeah. So we would mm. see these discontinuities in events, mm. and as a result of, of the aliens tinkering with the past, okay, whether they intend to tinker and, and cause the change or not, they would. And that's that paradox. The other thing, another evidence is if the aliens are really against us tinkering with nuclear weapons, they could have gone back in time and – uh tore up that letter that was sent to uh, uh, the president by, by Einstein. Yeah, they could have had Einstein fall off his ladder or something. <clears throat> yeah, uh, well, yeah, they could have done a lot of things to because they would have known that, you know what, this is going to lead to nuclear weapons. We've got to interact and, and prevent that from happening. They didn't do that. As much as they hate us to uh, be playing around with these things, they didn't do it because they couldn't. They can't go back in time. So I'm convinced you cannot go backwards in time. That's the bottom line. I think most physicists would probably agree with it, you on that one. Inter for, interesting. Forwards, you can forwards, go forward. Forwards is provable. They've done it on Earth. They put two stopwatches, uh, mm. uh, synced them up, put one on a jet plane, sent it around the world, passed it from plane to plane for a few days, came back three seconds slow. Yeah. It's, well, e it's uh, easy done. I think it's been said that the arrow of time only points in one direction. How That's yeah. forward. How interesting. How interesting. Mm. Robert, thank you so very, very much. You've been so kind to, to speak to us today in Europe. Uh, it's been my pleasure. Um, it's been my pleasure. We're, we're trying to get a bit and, of this. Uh, we're, Rob, we're trying to get a bit of this information over to our end of the globe because you, you've got a lot of it covered there in America. Yes, but you've got the thick end of the wedge. Yeah. Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. Uh, we're broadcasting to yeah. indeed. R Robert, uh, do please um, do a, a, a full fledged uh, plug of uh, all of your uh, books and your website and so on, and help help yourself to airtime. Go on. <laughs> okay, well, all of my books are available on Amazon. As far as the UK is concerned, yep. I would say go to Amazon. You can go to my website. Let me give you my website. Mm -hmm. yep. It's www.alienlog. That's one word, A-L-I-E-N-L-O-G, dot com. If you go there, you can click on a tab that will, if you want to buy a book, it'll take you um, to a, another screen, and mm -hmm. you can click on Amazon. And I, I think Amazon UK is listed. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you'll be right in the midst of Amazon UK, right where my book is, and you can select the books that you want. So they're all available as e-books, and I believe you can get printed books. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure how... <clears throat> I don't know how they show up, but they do. <clears throat> oh, yeah. So you can get, you can e get Kindle there. ones as well. <clears throat> yes, or just download them to your laptop. And anybody listening must have a laptop, otherwise how would they be listening? <laughs> that's true. <laughs> so that's, uh, um, and some, some very, very good reviews as well for Alien Log, Alien Log 2, The New World Order, 
and the science behind <laughs> alien encounters. Yeah, and, uh, thank you. Yeah, top reviews on, on I Amazon. I noticed those myself. Excellent stuff. Thank you, uh, thank you once more, Robert. And uh, well, we hope to get you back on again because we only ever scratch the surface in an hour. Really, <laughs> we okay. could probably go on for for four more. Yeah, that's right. This this. Well, I know I can go for three. <laughs> <laughs> no need to brag, right? Thank you very much, Robert. Thanks ever so much, Robert. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very good day. Thanks. Thanks for coming on. Brilliant. That was. Robert E. Farrell. Well, let's wrap it up because we've gone over time and it was well worth going over time with dear Robert. Oh, blimey, it was, yeah. It's all um, good stuff. Dr. Robert E. Farrell, best-selling author, academic. Yeah. UFO enthusiast. Expert. I Ex- think, I think, I think, I, silly me, I expert. I think we should yeah. at least give yeah. him an expert yeah. title. It's like I'm talking about model airplanes. Isn't yes, it? Yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a hobbyist. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much, Robert, and thanks for listening. Excellent. Thank you, everybody, and see you next week. You're listening to Alternative Future Radio, home of the weird, resting place of the paranormal. We'll take you to the furthest reaches of the galaxy and beyond. Strange phenomena, aliens, psychics, cryptozoology, conspiracy, holistic health, and UFOs. Alternative Future Radio, where spooky just got weird. listening to alternative future radio home of the weird resting place of the paranormal will take you to the furthest reaches of the galaxy and beyond strange phenomena aliens psychics cryptozoology conspiracy holistic health and ufos alternative future radio where spooky just got weird Good morning, everyone, and welcome again once more to the Out There Hour. Today, we're going to be investigating something very much out there. The Out There Hour on Alternative Future Radio. The Out There Hour with Basil and Mark. www.alternativefutureradio.com Yay! Yay! Yay. Good morning. Good evening. And good afternoon. (laughs) Europe, Africa, the Middle East, the world, and anybody in between. The Out There Hour. Yes. Dismantling the mainstream one piece at a time. Oh, I like that. Is that your new tagline? Have you been working on taglines all night? I'll keep saying it. You just keep saying it. Every week until until you get sick of it. I was going with where spooky got weird, but I I like that. Yeah, I know. I know. I do. Um, We're talking. It would be time to do something fun here in the music room. But, you know, you don't have to listen to things like this. There are better things you could be listening to, like Alternative Future Radio. And it's so easy now, with their new Android application, that you can download it for just $1.99. And then you wouldn't have to listen to me play the piano and my nurse Chloe play her flute. Find out more at alternativefutureradio.com. It's just $1.99. And, and PayPal will, will even bill you in your currency if, if you're not smart enough to be using dollars. Okay, hopefully on the line we should have live from, uh, from Phoenix, I believe. Uh, Robert Farrell, do we have you there, Robert? Am I right in Phoenix? Yes, you or is, do. is it Phoenix or just in Arizona? I think I got Phoenix from somewhere. Well, uh, I live just outside Phoenix in a retirement community called Sun City West. Ah, right, right. Oh, fair enough. Well, we weren't far off then. No. And you, you, were, you were saying before we went on air that you're a snowbird. You, uh, you move around the country, so you're sometimes in Phoenix and sometimes in, uh, in Connecticut, uh, following the yes. sun, I assume. Uh, well, trying to avoid the sun. Remind me, where's my piece of paper gone? You've got a third yeah. book. The Have you got my piece of paper oh, there, Basil? The, uh, the second book is rather interesting to me. Yeah? It's Alien Log 2, The New World Order. And I just wonder, what do you mean by the term uh, New World Order, Robert? Yeah, well, uh, I almost regret using that as mm. a uh, 
subtitle because people automatically assume that that's the uh, Illuminati's yeah. version of the New World Order. Yeah. And uh, it, it really isn't uh, it, to the extent that it, although it is a – uh, the New World Order is uh, a one-world government, yes, is the way yeah. it's presented in, in my book. What happened in – by the way, this is a science fiction book we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, but one of my characters, uh, who's a astrophysicist, accidentally gets abducted, and his captor, Quellen, mm -hmm. um, will answer any questions that, uh, that Corey, the, the astrophysicist, has. Um, and uh, one of the questions Corey has <coughs> is uh, – well, why are you uh, creating hybrids? Mm. You know, for what purpose? And Quellen says, well, they're going to be used to usher in the New World Order. And, of course, the next question is, well, what is that? Yeah. And the way – and what it is, it's a one-world government. And, in fact, I wish we had it right now, not necessarily one world, but I wish in the U.S. we had this form of government. It's based a lot on – on our government that we have in the U.S. To Dr. Robert E. Farrell. Yes. Best-selling author. Yes, Alien Log. Uh, retired professor of uh, engineering from uh, Penn, Penn State University. Yep. Mm -hmm. He's got all kinds of qualifications. Oh, yeah. Uh, he's written, uh, he's a best selling author. He's written two books Alien Log, Alien Log 2, and a factual book, The Science Behind Alien Encounters. Yep. So he's a professional engineer by trade. And he, he he does feature heavily on the engineering side of the, he the does. UFOs, he, the he, factual he, thing. He has an interest about UFOs and how do they actually fly. Yeah, yeah. He um, he he is pretty much an authority. He speaks all over um, the mm. US in uh, Arizona and Connecticut, I think, primarily. He does various talks. He was also in uh, MUFON. I think he was a regional director of the... The Mutual UFO Research Network, I think it stands for, in ah, America. I hadn't heard of that one. Yes, he was one of the regional uh, heads of that for uh, for a good few years, I uh, read. We're very, very, very fortunate to have him on the show today. Oh, yes, yes. Shall we do it? Let's do it. Um, uh, but are we having an ad? Yeah, <laughs> I hope you'll excuse me. I, I just wanted to play the piano just a little a little bit here. and I hope you don't mind. In, in fact, my... My my nurse Chloe is going to join me on on the flute here for ju for just a little bit if if that's okay with you. I just thought that in the summertime it gets hot out here. It's uh, it may go to 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh wow, good grief! Yeah, well we get used to it. You know they say it's a dry heat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've got a friend in Phoenix, and he says exactly the same thing. Yeah, it's a hundred and something degrees, but it's a dry heat, so it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, it's true. It's true. Uh, you can subtract about fifteen degrees from whatever you see on the news, uh, and, and if you're trying to compare it to your temperature, because you have much higher humidity, and that does mm. make uh, the comfort level. I mean, you could not stand 120 degrees in your country. You you would die, I'm sure. I don't think we will ever see that here. There's probably no danger of that at all. <laughs> so we 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 anyway we've established the weather situation in both countries. But what about UFOs? That's where we want to start. Basil, you've got a question on your lips. Well, it's not so much a question. I just want to point out, Robert is a very academic uh, gentleman. Oh yes, uh, he's a retired associate professor of engineering from Penn State University. Mm -hmm. He's had an MBA, a doctor of engineering. He spent 20 years in the plastics industry mm -hmm. prior to entering academia. Yeah. And not only that, he's also a best-selling author. Blimey. What do you think to that, Robert? You're, you're not doing too bad there, actually. <laughs> well, um, that's true. This is, I'm in my third career now, and that's writing. Mm. Mm -hmm. And you're on to – you've got four books. You've got Alien Log, Alien Log 2, and now 